Right. So, why this subject? Why this one in particular? So, I mentioned to Sean, when he asked me if I'd come and do a presentation, I said, well, actually, I've done one on a similar topic for quite a few different groups now. I was first asked to do it as part of a safeguarding conference. So, I've not come from a safeguarding background, and they wanted to do stuff, they wanted to call it gender, um, gender and identity, in the singular. And I said, look, can I put some S's in there? Can we talk about genders and identities? And also, you can't talk about gender without talking about sexuality as well. So I said, it's really important we do that. But when I'm using the safeguarding word, I, I mean it with a small s. So safeguarding as in protecting each one of us, not the formal safeguarding procedures. OK, looking after ourselves, safeguarding ourselves. So that was the first session I did. Now, whenever I do sessions on sexuality, if I start off with a group and say, right, what does the word sexuality mean to you? Loads of people say, oh, it's about LGBT issues. OK? Or um, whenever, whenever I'm doing sessions on it, it's those sort of issues that people want to explore. And I was in this room a couple of years ago, packed, re maybe 250 people in your, however many th th this room holds, that the place was packed. And we were doing stuff on sexuality issues, and there was a bloke at the back that just shouted out to me. And he said, look, if you're saying that people know their sexual orientation from a young age, why don't lesbian and gay people come out when they realise it? As if to say, why are they living a lie if they don't come out? So I said, look, I'm not going to answer that question. I want to turn it back to you. So I'll turn it to all of you now, but you don't have to say anything. Just think this, OK? Just in your mind, you're not telling me anything at all. I said to him, look, with lesbian and gay people, there's often a pressure on this idea of coming out, whatever that means, and what are you coming out of and what are you coming out into? So I said to the whole class, I said, right, for all of you now who consider yourselves to be straight, those of you who consider yourselves to be heterosexual, OK, so if, if that ticks a box with you... Right, think about this a minute. How old were you when you first realised you were straight? Who was the first person you ever told that you were straight? How did your parents react when you first told them? What did your best friends at, schools do, at school do? Now, that sort of question for straight people, you don't, often, you don't have to think about that. But whenever you use this term about coming out, for anybody that's not straight, that's what you're expecting. That they have to come out about things. And if somebody has come out and they've faced hostility, especially in healthcare practice, if they've faced hostility from someone, they may be more nervous of coming out again. So, again, that's important for yourselves. When you're called out on a shout, you go out, and there's something about the person they know but maybe they're nervous of saying to you, whatever it is, they're nervous of saying it to you. Not because they want to deceive you, but first of all, why is it any of your business? But secondly, um, if they've felt hostility before, are they now, and especially in a vulnerable situation, are they now going to get hostility from you? So that's really important, OK? So when we're talking about sexuality issues, even heterosexuals have a se sexuality, OK? That's important uh, to get across. Also, we need to move away from this. Too many people think the world well, is either black or white. You're either male, female, gay, straight, old, young, whatever. We're so keen on splitting in the world into opposites. But hopefully you know already, it isn't like that. There's loads of shades of grey in the middle, OK? It's not ju you're just one thing or the other. So that's an important fact to recognise. But also, even when we're talking about all the different letters, look how that list is getting longer. So, what, what ones on there do you know about or not know about? OK, well, the little Q could be questioning if the big Q is going to be queer. See, so, sometimes, if you see people just writing LGBTQ, what does the Q stand for? So, personally, I write it... I would put the two on there, a big Q and a little Q. Because some people like the term queer. Um, do any of you ever use that term? No? Would you find it okay to use it? Or offensive? It's something my grandparents say to be offensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's what? It's something my grandparents say to be, to be okay. offensive. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, mm. assumed it was. Mm. So if your grandparents are saying it, maybe it's of a generational thing. 
Because look at the way in which so many young people today use the word gay instead of that. So supposing you're young people in school and say there's a boy that's not too good at playing sport and someone says, oh, you're so gay. And they mean it in a derogatory way. I mean, you're so lame. Yeah, it's a derogatory term. But certainly when I was a child, well, I hadn't even heard of the word gay. Queer was the word. And if somebody said, Evans, you're a queer, that really was a negative thing to say to a person. But now it's been reclaimed, it's been totally transformed. Because at some universities, you even have whole, whole courses on queer studies, queer theory, queer spirituality, queer phenomenology, queer counselling. It's now become an academic discipline for some people. So, just like um, some of the other reclaimed words, and especially around sex, have you heard of any others? What types of words might be really offensive, but in the right context could be okay? Queen, yeah. So, um, if you're going to call somebody a queen, it could be seen as a derogatory thing to say, or somebody might reclaim that and feel happy with it. What about um, women's genitals? OK. Any particular word that's often you... Is that, see you next year. You're not going to say the word. You're not going to... You, you're not, you're not going to say the word cunt. OK, okay right, OK, OK. <laughs> right, so cunt is one of the reclaimed... So queer is a reclaimed term. So people that might say, look, call me queer then, because... Or I'm going to call myself queer, because if you use it of yourself, you disempower people using it you negatively. Another one would be nigger. So as a white person, if I said to a black person, you're such a nigger, that is totally offensive and racist. But look how many black people may say to each other, you're such a nigger. And that's acceptable there. Or commercial sex workers using the word whore. So if, if you're driving down the street and you shout out of your car window at somebody, you're whore, that's wrong. But one to another might say, look at the way you're dressed tonight, you're such a whore, yeah? And in that case, it's reclaimed, it's taken the power out of it. OK? So cunt is another one. Um, a lot of feminists use the word cunt because it's often been used in such a derogatory way by male... Look at this, there. Because it's used by males against females, and in such a put-down way, if a woman reclaims that word, and if she likes the word about herself, then when anybody calls her that, she, thanks, that's a nice thing. Or, like, if anybody says to me now, David, you're so gay, I say, thanks, it's a gift, yeah? So uh, reclaiming it, and then it's not... It's not going to be able to be used as an offensive term against people. OK? That doesn't mean if you're dealing with a woman and she's got uh, uh, genital problems, for example, don't go up and say, how's your cunt today? OK? But she might use that word to you. So that's important because anything about sex is language. And quite often when we're using language, for some people it may be offensive. OK? So it's negotiating how to even use the language. Because if you stop and think about it, say, your own genitals. As little children, what names were you taught for your genitals? Go on, you can tell me this if you want. What names did you call your genitals as little kids? Knob. Your knob, OK? Dick. Your dick. Any others? Beans, we bitch. Meat and, right, OK. So, a lovely one there. So, all of a sudden, you've got a problem with your meat and two veg. So, unless you've learned other words for it, you go along to your GP... Oh, excuse me, doctor, I've got, I've got a problem with my knob, or my dick, or my cunt, or my fanny. Yeah, what words are you going to use? Because as children, people often use little, little childlike words. You know, it might be your front bottom, or your fanny, or your tuppence, or... <laughs> Dare I ask for any more? You know, little names like this. But then look at the number of people who do not know what other terminology to use. And sometimes they get it wrong. So supposing a woman has got an itch on the outside and she might go to the doctor and say she's got a problem down there. That's not between her toes. She means down there somewhere else. And the doctor might say, but where down there? What do you mean? And she might say, well, my vagina. But the vagina is the inside bit, not the outside bit. So even people using language, sometimes they get it wrong. 
Okay, so language is really important in anything to do with sex, sexualities and genders. Because sometimes it's used in very offensive ways, sometimes it may be rude or provocative. There's so many ways in which just that word, your knob, you know, you may, call, you, you may call your penis your knob, you know, and then you call somebody as a knobhead. Or, you know, is it that sign, dickhead? But what happens if you do it on the side? That's a right dickhead. Okay. <laughs> okay. So language is really, really important. Are you okay with that? Yeah. And the, the, the reason I've written down trisexual twice there, Robbie Williams once said that um, he'd try anything once. Okay. So trisexual. Um, what about this term here, heteroflexible? So with that cue meaning questioning, it could be somebody will say, well, actually, I don't know because maybe I'm still a virgin at the moment and I haven't done anything at all. Or sometimes I've been having thoughts about someone of the same sex or the opposite sex, but I've never done anything, so I'm not too sure. So that could be the questioning. But then, when people say they're bi-curious, what does that word mean? If someone's bi-curious? They want to try it. Say again? They want to try it. They want to try it. Yeah, yeah, it could be indeed. They must, well, look, I've never done this, but, you know, I'll give it a go. Yeah, so it could be bi-curious. And in a way, that could be, like, heteroflexible. So somebody might say, well, no, I'm straight, but under the right circumstances, something may happen. And that's really important because of this one here. Um, and I'll send you an article that I, I got published on this. Whenever we're thinking of sexuality, don't just think of it as this black and white, you're either one thing or the other. You're either gay or straight. Don't think of it in such fixed terms. But consider at least these four things. So there's the person's orientation. So someone might, well, look, I'm straight. OK, that's it. Right, that's my orientation. And then their identity or their label may actually match up with that. So supposing you've got a man and woman married, they don't have to tell you they're straight, you just automatically presume that they are because they're a man and woman married. But supposing they come from a culture or a country or a religion where men and women have got to get married. And once they get married, they've got to start having children for the family. But you don't know where their eyes are looking. So it could be a bloke married to a woman and now she's pregnant, she's having a baby and everyone thinks, well, they're straight. Well, you don't even have to think that. You automatically assume they're straight. But he might be having sex with the bloke next door or having sex with somebody in public spaces. Now, if he is, and if he's not using condoms, for example, how is he then going to go home and say to his wife, look, we, start, we need to start using condoms? Because supposing he has got a sexual infection, how is somebody who's having a relationship with the person not using condoms and now they've got to swap and start using them? How do you have that conversation with your partner? OK? So what this could mean is a per so you've got your orientation, the identity or the label, but their attractions may be different to the label for their orientation. And therefore, their behaviours may be as well. Now, a few years ago, a team... I might have told you this on the HIV course recently. A team of four of us went to Bahrain. Did I tell you? Yeah, I told you that one, yeah. So we went to Bahrain where somebody thought that there's no HIV in Muslim countries because there are no gay males in Muslim countries. Because that's the perception. If you've got countries where people are invisible, then why do you need to know anything about them? OK? So uh, it's really important, whenever you are talking about sexuality, try then to think of at least those four things. And if you're thinking of those four, it's going to stop you falling into the trap of thinking, oh, someone's one or the other. Does that make sense? Is there anything you want to say? Yeah, go on. No, well, that would be the label then, the identity or the label. So, yes, you're right, the, the attractions may be the orientation. So let me go on, go on with that example then. Supposing it's a man and woman that live in a country where men and women have got to get married. Maybe they were primed from being little children. You two are going to get married and you're going to start giving us babies. 
that. But if, if the person then has got attractions elsewhere, if their eyes are elsewhere, then the, those two things are matching up together, but not that one. Okay, and that's why it's important to consider that, especially in the healthcare world today, here in London, for example, when we've got people coming from other countries and cultures, in their own country or culture, maybe they couldn't even be out about this. Like, Uganda has had a really bad um, uh, recurrence of homophobia in the last few weeks. Um, they wanted to bring in a law to execute gay people a few years ago, and now someone's trying to bring it back through Parliament again. So supposing you're called out to someone from Uganda, and in fact, in this area, in Woolwich and in Blackheath, in the last two months, there have been two really serious homophobic attacks, one in Woolwich, one in Blackheath. So supposing you're called out, someone's been beaten up, and they're left in the bushes there, something's gone wrong. But if they come from a country or a culture that they can't even be open about this, or if they've got problems with immigration, they may be frightened to tell you in the first place. They might not even want the police involved. So all of these things are sensitive issues for you. Yeah, is that making sense? And did that answer your question then? Yeah, but, yeah OK. In fact, even orientation. So what's the difference between the term sexual preference or sexual orientation? What's, the what's a preference? I think, yeah. um, like, at least to me, you know, orientation is kind of a, a category you fit into, but that doesn't mean that you are 100%. Um, it's say if you're bi, you don't have to equally like men and women. Okay. You are still bi, you're just yeah. more attractive. No, but you just prefer men, not prefer women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that's another really important thing. Again, people aren't just one extreme or the other. Lots of people are somewhere, they're in the middle, and that's humanity. That's life, somewhere in the middle. It's not the people are one extreme or the other. But sometimes the difference between preference and orientation, lots of people get those two terms confused. But preference is what you, choose, what you like. Oh, I prefer cake with cream on top than cake without. You prefer something. Whereas orientation, the word literally means the way you're facing. That's what that word means. If you're orientated, so you're facing a particular way. That's what the word originally means. So if a person says, well, I'm gay, but I like actually having sex after food or head to toe in rubber, whatever, they're, they're your preferences, OK? But where there's a problem, supposing a young child comes home from school and says, Mum, there's something I need to tell you. I'm gay. And she, well, we didn't bring you up to be like that, so you can bloody well unchange, you know? It's not a preference, you're not choosing. And that's really important there, because so many people think that sexual orientation is a choice. Look at all this, um, uh, you might have heard in the news, stuff about uh, um, gay cure therapies, which have been banned in the UK. But, what's her name, Anne Widdicombe, the MEP, the really potty MEP, um, uh, Anne Widdicombe, she thinks that one day a cure may be found. Well, are we ever going to find a cure for heterosexuality? It's as, it's as stupid as saying that. So an orientation is different to your preference. Your preference is what you like doing, as opposed to your orientation, that's who you are. Yeah, is that making sense? Yeah, okay, great.